Hello and welcome to the Comedy Slab podcast. I'm Shane O'Connor, he's Adrian Lacey, and this week's episode is powered by tiramisu. Uh, <laughs> and I, and well, I, how do you do? And I say that because uh, friends of ours popped over the other day and uh, and Chris makes a very nice tiramisu. And whenever I, uh, whenever I get the opportunity, I always say, can you bring a tiramisu with you? And uh, which is not easy to say, is it really? Particularly if you've got a few. Because it's really cinema to the But he brought one with him. And I think like it was soaked in half a bottle of um I said Rambuie to you, but it was actually Tia Maria. That's even worse. It is, isn't it, really? It's one of those hardcore liqueurs, isn't it that? So uh, I always confuse it with Tina Marie. Um, i i miss the syndrome don't you uh, oh i've got i've got syndrome missing syndrome 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 (laughs) stevens michael syndrome stevens (laughs) i told you i told you it's the two maria's kicked in early (laughs) it's working i think you should have some every week yeah well we should call it the comedy slab liqueur (laughs) <laughs> and and we have to drink a bottle of liqueur before we start. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Anyhow, if you're not joined this podcast before, um, then it's nothing really to do with liqueurs or getting drunk or not being able to say words. Although that does, in fact, all of those things feature in that podcast, strangely enough. We're all about comedy. At various times, yes. And uh, we love comedy. And uh, every week we get together having had a look or a listen to a comedy. And uh, between now and the end of the podcast, uh, we'll, we'll alternately choose, by the way, Adrian chooses one week and I choose the next if you haven't gone back through the back catalogue. <clears throat> and um, we'll uh, we'll play you a couple of clips between now and the end of the podcast and we'll also mark it up and give it a score out of five each, giving it a grand total out of ten, just so we can kind of give ourselves a definitive answer. We also will um, give you some comedy news, which is coming up in a second. Um, but I chose Age of Outrage uh, for this week. Um, which is a brand new um, BBC sketch show. It's quite interesting, actually, because I don't, I don't know, Adrian, whether you picked up there's, there's more to it than just it being a sketch show. Did you, did you pick up some of the peripheral stuff? Oh no! What, what, what? I had a computer once that used to talk about integrated peripherals, and I didn't know then, and I don't know now what it means. This, well, so. on, on the outskirts of this, on the outskirts <laughs> of Age of Outrage, is the fact that this is um, this pioneers visual production, um, which we'll come back to. It had to because I think it was made largely during the uh, the COVID thing. Um, okay, but uh, yeah, so they—I'll they, I'll tell you more that I've, I've read up on it, and uh, in fact, I had a look at the uh, the manufacturer's website, as it were. So we'll uh, we'll we'll head through that as we go. Um, but before we get into the uh, the meat and two veg of the uh, the old podcast for this week, a bit of comedy news, which I saw, and I thought you'd be interested because you're you're what I would <laughs> class as a bit of a writer. <laughs> I think. The operative term there is bit rather than writer at the moment. You write a bit. Um, I write a bit. There was this story. I, I originated from the Scotsman, didn't it, I think, um, mm. as you pointed out. But, um, but I, as a part Scot, I'm too tight to actually pay for a subscription. So we, we're looking at it on, what is it, chortle.co.uk. You do wonder how the stereotype works with the publication called the Scotsman, don't you? But hey-ho, up, up to them. It's, the, it's their marketing budget. They do with it as they like. Um, yeah, Frankie Boyle saying he'd like to quit touring uh, and become a writer. He doesn't want to do stand up anymore. Doesn't mention any of those dreadful panel shows that he uh, he attends on a regular basis. But uh, he wants to become a writer. And primarily, I think what he's saying is that this immediate feedback loop that you have as a comedian is mm-hmm. appears to be getting on his wick a bit, doesn't it? Is that how you read it as well? Well, I was a bit confused by that because when he said, "I'm trying to find the line," he said, "There is that thing sometimes with stand up." where you have a funny idea, but will a bunch of people in a basement agree? Mm. For a moment, I thought he was talking about TV comedy commissioners. Oh. But clearly, he's talking about the audience, isn't he? I'm being a bit dumb here. I, see, I thought he was, he was holding to ransom a group of people in his basement. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't. Well, that's possible too. <laughs> I mean, he's, uh, as you pointed out to me, I, could, I, I let it go, but uh, it is worth commenting. He has a 14-year-old son called Thor. Yeah. I mean, do we let that go? Without comment? Well, we obviously haven't. Do you know what? I just want to know what the story is behind that now. I mean, is, it, is he married to a to a, um, a Scandinavian lady? or <laughs> I think it's called punishing the next generation for your for your own 
shortcomings, but that's I mean, terribly judgmental. Not least, it sounds like he's going into hospital with it, or his doctors with a complaint and a speech impediment. Hello, <laughs> I'm Thor Boyle. <laughs> I mean, bro, bro. Oh, I don't know. well, uh, yeah, Woody Allen uh, has a son called Satchel. Um, Frank Zappa, you'll know this. Oh, yeah, it? Moon Unit and Dweezil. Moon, moon Unit and Dweezil. Although, although uh, Moon Unit now just calls, goes by the name of Moon, doesn't she, I think? Is that any better? I mean... Not really. She's probably worked out she's the only unit called Moon, so... Yeah. Right. It's, it's like me just being Adrian, provided there's no other Adrians in the room. Yes. And uh, lest we forget Bob Geldof uh, and, um, rest her soul, Paula Yates' uh, daughter, Fifi Trixibel. Mm. I mean, they all, they're all they all under the same heading, um, showbiz parents. I, 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 I wonder about Geldof. I mean, he, Fifi Trixibel, why couldn't he give his daughter an, a normal name like his other daughter, Peaches? Do you know what I mean? It's not fair, <laughs> is it, really? Golly gosh, yes. Anyway, um, that's a, a rich seam. Um, but to come back to the matter in hand, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not a great stretch to try and understand why someone, given a choice between schlepping up and down the U of K and uh, quite possibly way beyond these shores, um, a choice between that and sitting by a laptop, by a pool or by wherever you want to be, wherever you can get Wi-Fi mm. and uh, tapping away. I mean... Isn't that a no-brainer after, what, 20-plus years on the road? But you you do this. I mean, you make it sound like it's some walk in the park. And I know it isn't because we've had conversations off slab <laughs> about how difficult it is and about how much you put into it. And it, it is, I mean, I would never offend you and say, oh, it's easy. You just get your laptop out and do a bit, do a bit of writing. Because well, you... I wouldn't mind because we could always have knockabout. I mean, it's hard work uh, doing any night shift. I can't stay awake for that. And it's hard, you know, stacking shelves. Mm. It's not intellectually, academically hard, but it's hard work to keep going. And it's not well paid. It's not high status. What's your future? You might be doing it temporarily fine. If, if if you see it as till death is due part. So I, I really, I'm, yeah, I, I don't think I'd be that tolerant of people in their artist garret going, oh my God, it's, it's terrible, it's terrible. Let me put it this way then, because you've done both, haven't you? I mean, you've, you've, you've stood on the stage and done stand up and you're, you know, now writing. And I just wonder, because I kind of, I kind of get a sense, I might, I might be reading between these words here and getting it completely wrong, but mm. I get a sense of, um, uh, relaxation from his writing, or I get a sense of he certainly doesn't have the same anguish and angst. If I said to you, okay, for the next year, you've got to earn your living either doing stand-up or writing, which one would you choose? I I think I would choose the writing, but knowing full well I was choosing the soft option. So I still have, uh, I think it'd be true to say, yeah, greater admiration for people go out on stage. And even if you're a name, you still go out in a sense, every gig is different and you kind of go out cold. Mm. We don't see that. We're not inside their heads. We're, they they come out bold as brass, puff up their chests, and they're the big name, whoever it is. But, I mean, like Michael McIntyre, I happen not to be a, a particular fan, but hats off to him. The way he described the torment he goes through with every gig and, and he worries if, you know, his own show, so in two halves with a... With a, a break in between he worries he won't get them back even if he's had a fantastic first half mm. he worries what if i lose it and I, i've heard tim vines the same every night he thinks he's going to die as in the comedic sense mm. i've mm. heard uh and i'm sure you could add scores of names to that i'm, well, I'm reading jimmy carr's book at the moment it's a bit of an odd book um it's like a kind of is it back to front memoir and self-help all rolled into one it's a bit strange but it's interesting read but he mm. talks about you know dry heaving before he's going on stage and oh and, yeah yeah yeah. you know and, and not not now he said he's quite comfortable with it now he said but in the early days he said you know i kind of i kind of went out there he was quite young in terms of uh in terms of comedy but here's one more final point then on the frankie ball thing before we move on to age mm. of outrage um you see the madonna of the comedy world do you think because this is, to my knowledge, this is what at least his second, maybe third repositioning as a comedian. Um, because he he used to be, I mean, he wasn't a right-wing comedian in that sense, but he used to um, not be afraid who he's upset. And he's kind of repositioned himself comedically now, I think much, much further to the to the left of politics, as it were. And, you mm -hmm. know, and, and people kind of remind him of the jokes that he used to, 
to tell and, and he and he doesn't kind of have much to say about that but i just wonder whether he's he's this is a this is a um, uh, a, a repositioning in terms of and like i say he's the madonna of comedy he's reinventing himself here well when you said you know did i think he was the madonna of comedy i just saw him in a conical bra <laughs> a uh, comical bra can't, or a conical bra <laughs> and and i can't bra unth- a com- conical bra <laughs> i can't unthink either both are awful yes. and the stuff of nightmares thank you very much uh I have to say, I, I, I haven't caught up with him for ages. Uh, I kind of got the shtick and I kind of liked it as it was up to that point. And then he, I don't know whether he crossed a line himself in the pre, so what you might think of as act one, mm. or whether he crossed my line, my line shifted, because that's always possible, isn't it, as you get older. Yeah, yeah. He's got older and he wants to do different things. Uh, how, uh, what was the middle bit? Has Madonna had a three three part career? Then are you say oh, probably about seven part, hasn't she? Really, when you think about it, she just keeps reinventing herself. Doesn't but she's she? still a, oh, okay. She's a bit like acting, David Bowie. I mean, He's, it was it was a classier mm. classier version of uh, of Madonna's reinventions, I think, really. But yeah, I just wonder whether it's whether it's you know, and and if it is, then you kind of think, well, very shrewd, very shrewd business, really. At the end of the day. Uh, if you want to read more on that story, it's in Chortle, or it's on chortle.co.uk, I should say. Um, so, Age of Outrage, then. Tell me. Tell me, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lacey. What did you What did you know? What did you know? Tell me everything I you knew. I knew no more than what you told me. And as I said last week, I'm very happy to repeat myself because I haven't got anything new to add. Um, I was looking forward to... Uh, actually, I may not have quite said it in these terms. I said it was a while since we'd slabbed a sketch show and i really would struggle can you remember the last time we actually did and what it was um i, I can't. can't actually radio or no. tv um modern toss was modern toss a sketch show yeah uh, well thought but um wouldn't do any harm to go back uh, a few years to um oh well, we've never done the fast show for instance have we you ain't seen me you're right <laughs> And uh, we need Colin Hunt, the office joker. But anyway, I was talking about him the other week. Um, so yes, I was embracing of the uh, of the form. All right. My form was embracing, and uh, my conical bra twitched. While you're in your lingerie, <laughs> relaxing, <laughs> shall we? Uh, shall we give people a flavour for what age of outrage? I, th- I think I can hear the power switches of what? the nation's pods. <laughs> Pod play devices go click. They're they're doing the opposite of casting. They're uncasting. They're uh, <laughs> whatever they're doing. Um, let's have a quick clip then of uh, Age of Outrage. And um, we in the first clip we chose, or I chose, I should say, um, because interestingly enough, um, again, the little bit of a problem. I have to go kind of a little way in because um, there was um, well, like there was a lovely <laughs> there was a lovely montage of people looking at springs, wasn't there at the start? Oh, a bit visual, but yeah, a bit visual. So I couldn't use that one because it was the pun. The joke was at the end of it, and they said, "Welcome to." They were all looking at different springs, um, you know, like as in bits of metal wound up spring, and uh, mm. and at the end, it's, it's somebody says, "Welcome to Spring Watch," which I didn't see coming at all. I'll be honest with you. No, do you know what I thought? I thought it was repair shop, which I haven't ever seen. But it was all these mechanical devices. I thought, yeah, oh, yeah, make you take of that. So well, I'm glad it blindsided you as well. Anyway, I, I spilled <laughs> on a bit. And uh, we join the real-life continuity man, uh, a guy called Matt Rosser, uh, who's telling us what's coming up later on TV. Later tonight here on BBC One, a brand new series as members of the public compete to put on the UK's best post-funeral gathering. That's The Great British Wake Off, presented by Nick Knowles in half an hour. Before that, it's time for another visit to our Fly on the Wall series, following the young hopefuls at Countryfile Presenter College. It's the start of the second day's training at Country File Presenter College. Autumn, a time of plenty. <clears throat> Autumn, a time of plenty. Mm. Great. A bit of big improvement, yes. Just, I want you to try and make that voice a little richer. Mm? Let's think warm bath, smooth honey. Remember, this is Sunday evening. This is not, it's not lean forward television. It's a relaxing foot massage, a scented candle of a show. So try it again. <clears throat> Autumn, a time of plenty. Brilliant. Yes, it's almost there. 
Before you say anything else, can I just ask you the question, because you know these things. Is lean forward television a real term? Yes, but I, I'm more disturbed by the term generally. I've never heard it, I have to be honest, heard in, uh, never heard it in a TV context, but I knew exactly what they meant. Um, yeah, I've heard it in a radio context. Okay. Uh, we're not lean forward listening, and you just, it's like, you know, Hitler's doing very well for us on Tuesday nights. You, you just have to keep a straight face, and if you want the work, you just you nod sagely. Say, mm, yeah, it's very intellectual, that. Anyway, sorry, I've, I've right. knocked you off your stride there. The, uh, you did. Well, was I on my stride? Well, you were um, about to give us a, you were going to give us a, a headline, weren't you? I know yes, you've, like. you've broken every convention in the slab rule book, and I'm going to throw it at you. But um, it gave me more thinking time. So uh, do you want your headline straight away? Go or on. The headline is... Hang on. <clears throat> outrage outage. I.e., where's the outrage? Oh, okay. There ain't none. Yeah. Well, I couldn't find... I was trying to find the blurb that you read from last week, and I thought I'd find it on iPlayer. Yeah. Maybe it is there. This was... Um a quizzical, sceptical and humorous look at modern life with a variety of sketches that poke fun at the frustrations of life in the digital age. Mm. BBC Wales. That could have been for a totally different show, which I would have enjoyed. And I sort of enjoyed bits of this. I've got to, be, I've got to keep one foot on the brake because it's tempting to be not as nice as one should be about uh. it. But, but, but the... the it's the gap between what they're promising in the title and in the blurb you've just read yeah. and what they actually deliver, which is very introspective TV culture. Could have been done any time in the last mm, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it takes the mickey out of continuity announcers. Oh, that's original. Uh, I remember working on Ben Elton. Um, I love the title of the show, Man from Auntie. Uh, explanation for people not familiar the BBC was called Auntie in the early days because it was thought to be well I was going to say patronising but matronising or whatever and auntieising you know it was a bit patting you on the head there dear um, and uh, and uh, that had a Mickey take of idents as they're called that was if anyone remembers if you're familiar with BBC One back in the 90s I'm sure it's on the YouTube um, they had hot air balloons do you remember those Shane yes I do At the yeah, start yeah. of show well, yeah there was there was yeah. a, there was a um, when they were doing the continuity thing obviously you can't see this on the Comedy Slab podcast but they were doing a um, a spoof of of the the visuals of those continuities as well yes. weren't they which I you see I when I because I haven't watched BBC One for 15 years did you have to mug up on what their idents look like? No, I couldn't. I couldn't be bothered to be honest with you. But, I mean, because <laughs> I, I kind of figured that's what it would be. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah. But and I you're mean, right. And then was that the toilet roll one, which was moderately amusing? Yeah, they're all kind of like fingering the toilet roll, aren't they? For some reason, I don't uh, <laughs> fingering. <laughs> fingering. <laughs> Slightly unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we even hear a bit of it under the announcer, who you told me just before we hit record. Yeah. I didn't realise is a real bona fide Welsh announcer. And I'm not going to have a go at any Welsh announcers because Rob Bryden was one once and they're, they're still part of my tribe and I will defend them. It's the Mickey taking, which obviously, it's Matt Rosser, isn't it? Matt Rosser, um, yeah. Who, who I yeah. think if, if, you're a, if you're a resident of, uh, of Wales, then I think you will know, and you're a BBC One fan, obviously, uh, BBC One mm. Wales, then you'll, you'll, you'll know his voice. I think he's head of, uh, I, look, I looked him up on... Uh, LinkedIn, and I think he's he's uh, as they often are. Um, mm. Their their chief announcer is head of presentation for for BBC One Wales. So um, uh, yeah, but people would people would know the voice. Uh, so I'm not having a go at him, and I'm not having a go at any. I, I do worry there's been some kind of mismatch between. I, I mean, it's very easy to say what we see on screen. Oh, that's not working. Let's blame those individuals. Well. Bits of it do work, firstly, and I'm not. I'm trying not to play play the blame game because you. I, I'm widening out the shot. There may have been some faulty lines of communication with the commissioner. Um, we don't know that, do we? They're, I mean, most of them are young actors. Um, are you at that stage? If you get a chance to be on BBC One Wales, BBC Wales on, oh, they change the name every other week. 
but also get on iPlayer. You know, you're starting out in your acting career. You're not going to say, oh, it has to be an absolutely perfect job unless I say yeah. Uh, mm. uh, uh, otherwise, I won't say yes to it. And the commissioner might have been wanting, oh, can we have something for sort of our 55 plus audience? Some of the cast did, did were involved in the writing as well. Well, there were there were jokes in there. I mean, I, I don't know whether you didn't laugh because I can see you on Skype and and you never like to give it away before you give the headline. But <laughs> or I, I I'm mean, just a moody soul. Those, I mean, I did like those play on words. You know, the 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 thing about the funeral and the, the Great British Wake Off, um, mm. and there were some other but, ones as well that that I can't, that did actually kind of make me laugh out loud. Really, I thought, oh, that's that I quite like. But that. at what level? I, I know this. Well, we do get analytical, and I have got my pointy head on because having been a, a freelance continuity announcer for 15 years, I'd had all the jokes. I felt I'd written all the jokes I had about shows, and I wanted to, I felt like, you know, the announcer can end up being the bridesmaid and never the bride. Yeah. And I, but again, not having a go at them. It's a nice gig. It's a really lovely way to earn a living. Uh, you might not be paid a million, but it's an enjoyable gig. And I used to come out of the continuity booth feeling better than I walked in. So that's, to me, a definition of a good job. Um, but at what level are you enjoying it? Are you enjoying it? And at what level is Matt playing it at? Is he sending himself up and his kind? See, I don't know whether he's sending up announcers or whether he's sending up the ridiculous things that they, they're made to do. It's a bit like thinking that when Hugh Edwards reads the news and he says... Um, you know, Palestine are being attacked by whoever, that he's on one particular side or another because he's just reading the words on, on the screen, isn't he? You know, and, and one of the reasons I left uh, radio was because increasingly editors wanted to control the words that come out of your mouth and make you sound like you have particular beliefs and thoughts. Mm. And that, which is totally wrong. I don't think you, should, you know. If you're, if you're a radio presenter, you should, you know, unless you're unless you're reading the news, you should be able to to put your view, um, or, or or not. You know, depending on what you want to do. But you certainly shouldn't be putting somebody else's view. Um, mm. But yeah, so I, I'm not really quite sure. Whether, I'd kind of got it that they were he was sending or they were sending up kind of what the ridiculous things. Um, that come out of TV. But I'm with you on this whole... There was a lot of introspective, mm -hmm. all jokes at the BBC expense. I couldn't I mm -hmm. couldn't care less. I mean, I don't study the BBC to that degree, that I know it that well, that mm -hmm. I would get all of the stuff, like I say. I mean, there was, again, there were great... In the BBC, the, uh, the, um, uh, the Country File Presenter College... <laughs> <laughs> they said we go you through liked I like the bit where he said we go through rigorous um interviews and he says to the woman, Have you ever been a blue preacher presenter? And she says yes and he goes, Right, you're in. Um and that you know, and I kind of mm. think there's there's those kind of little nods that I I I did quite like, but but I kind of got a bit a bit BBC fatigued. I felt I'd joined yeah. up again and I felt they all needed to get out more. Yeah. Yeah. Or or even take the gags and go, right, okay, let's set these somewhere else. Or let's do them in a different way. Do you know, it's, it's, it wouldn't be. I mean, I haven't really thought of a good example for that because it's um, it wasn't something I thought of too much at the time. But I should have done. I should have thought of a, a you know a way of saying instead of doing this, do that, and you could have got the same amount of gags out of it. But but it's it's surprising. Do you, do you, it? do you mean you could have had the same? I might be misunderstanding what you're saying, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Do you mean you could have had the same type of joke about? country file but not even about a tv program yeah you could have done instead of country file presenter college you could have had a um insurance helpline college mm. and done and done similar kinds of jokes to all the cliches around that particular business mm. do, do you understand but what it, i mean but, yeah i do understand but again haven't you given the game away by using the word cliche which is if you're sending up cliches in the end don't you just add to more cliches yeah i suppose so I mean, but that's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, there's, there's, there isn't, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, any limit on the amount of cliches we're allowed in the world at any one time. Well, as one famous post-war Labour politician whose name escapes me said, it's just cleach after cleach after cleach. <laughs> <laughs> I think he were a northerner. That's what I did in that accent. <laughs> well, that's a cliche in itself, isn't it? That he's well, a exactly. Yes, or uh, cleach, as he would pronounce it. Uh, can I ask you? Did hmm. you hear any outrage? No, I mean the reference, the age of outrage, is supposedly that's that's now, isn't it? We are now living in the age of outrage. But that's if what... you call a program that, don't you 
give signals in the title of the show, which is, you know, we all want to know, does it do what it says on the tin? Aren't you signalling that you're doing something like more at the end of the Frankie Boyle rather than Matt Baker from well, look, Country Farm? I mean, it depends how literally you say the, uh, you know, the the, the programmes. You can sit there and watch a Western for 50 minutes and go and say at the end of it, say, well, well, that chaparral wasn't very high, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say it didn't come from the West. Yeah. <laughs> and that spaghetti Western didn't give one single no pasta recipe. Yeah, but do, do you know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I didn't really take it as because I'm the phrase to me means that the, the modern times, you know, the, we're now living in the age of outrage. Everybody's outraged, and it's the age. Yeah, of but age there's of, no, but there's no hint of it. The last place on earth, and he actually said it's lean back TV or whatever he said. Yeah, it's a cozy, warm bath. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this whole thing, like I say, the whole the age of outrage, just, uh, just it's to me just signal modern. It wasn't really about oh, we're going to be outraged well, by this. My or, point is, it's still not that modern. Although we might want to talk because we haven't touched on it to be fair there is a nod to the internet i was going to say where's all the digital stuff of the blurb well there was something there we heard in clip number one well let me tell you something that that i just dug out by looking up the production company um mm, because which we must mention because yeah because i went on to their uh, small and clever productions i went on to their yeah. website it's quite interesting they do make a lot of stuff for online um but mm. they've they've made things like if anybody knows all of this that i think that you'll have only seen these possibly in wales but there was a program called uh james and jupp which is miles jupp and um reese james um right. uh, running about the place um there's a program called halfway the really welsh quiz and the dylan thomas pub quiz uh, before they made this. But the interesting thing is that they say that they are pioneers in visual productions, in sketch comedy. And so it was all, it was, they reckon it's the first time a sketch comedy has been done green screen. I don't know if you noticed that, but but most of it wasn't on, it was on visual sets rather than, um, rather than, uh, uh, like, sorry, virtual sets, I should say, not visual right. sets, virtual production, virtual sets. Um, rather than actual sets. I mean, there were times when you were meant to know the, the gag later on. Oh, when they're riding uh, the horses and that, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and it's made under COVID conditions, or yeah. that was the joke of the sketch. Yes. Are you saying it actually was made under COVID conditions, or yeah. they were... Yeah, this is where they pioneered it, apparently, because they couldn't, they couldn't find most of, the, most of the sets they wanted to use had become locked down. Right, and that's what they say. And they, I watched their video. They've done a small presentation video about how they got to where they were. And it was fascinating. It was to uh, to see. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they've done all these virtual uh, uh, virtual sets and, and the technology and how it all works. And it was fascinating. Fascinating, really was. Whether it whether it lends anything to the comedy, yeah, probably not. Well, well let's talk about the uh, the the internet send up. Um, well, that's the next clip, isn't it? So, shall, shall we shall we have a listen to the next clip and then and then probably it make more sense because everybody's heard it? Do you think? Yes, my my brain is getting all the right clips, not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> I show my but, son uh, only falls and horses where Grandad says, "Oh, Dell, it wasn't me; it was my brain." Um, <laughs> because my son son tends to say that. Oh, well, I'm on the subject of my son. Can I mention as well? If you are Welsh, by the way, my son thinks Wales is a fabulous country now because he just thinks it's amazing that anyone's got a dragon on their flag, as I, I showed him some flags the other day. And right. he said, he's got a dragon on their flag. He thinks we're <laughs> right bunch of wussies now with having a dragon on there. But I did say we've got a coat of arms and we've got a unicorn. Didn't seem to help. Um, anyway, so as the uh, as the show is built, as I mentioned, as a kind of a comedy sketch show revolving around the modern world, as we've, we've talked about this age of, age of outrage, um, I guess it was inevitable that we'd have at least one YouTuber. Lights, camera, Sebastian. Hey guys, and welcome back to more movie magic with me, Sebastian, on cinema. Now, let's get critical. Critical. I hope you have a parent and or guardian present because the brutal violence on screen here is not for the faint-hearted. What I think makes this film even more disturbing is the filmmaker's refusal to give the psychopath at the center of his movie any sort of retribution. He escapes unscathed, which I think is an astute comment to the US penal system. Penal system. If you can stand the violence, which include harrowing scenes of a man literally on fire, then I 100% recommend this twisted thriller. Home Alone gets three stars. 
So that's it from me this week, guys. My final note to you is, life is not a movie. You only get one take. So make sure you subscribe to my channel and make sure you hit that notification bell. I'll be back next time with more great movie reviews. Catch you soon, guys. Bye. So very convincingly done visually, but you'd expect that of a modern production company working under those circumstances. And you have only got to observe how it's done online. Mm. Um, I've felt, and it's not the first time, well, it's more often you, I think, says it than I do. Mm. Um, I felt the lack of script editing here because the gag is Home Alone. That's the gag. That's yeah. where the laugh is. And it carries on. And that seems to me a bit naive and woolly. And that's what you do as you're honing your craft. But by the time people are on national TV, Welsh TV or UK TV or wherever it is, I expect they've, they've you know, rounded out those rough edges, smoothed them off, and they know where the gag is and they move on. But it just carried on. Yeah. With, and, with and, to, much... and to not a great destination either, was it really? Where no. it carried on to wasn't, wasn't anywhere better than if you'd have left it there. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought it was one of the weakest sketches, certainly. Um, is that why you chose it? Yeah. Just really, and and also the fact that it was one of the non PPC ones that I could find. You know, there weren't there weren't yeah. many that uh, at least as a, as a, it, it lives up to the the digital that's in the blurb, the word digital. Because otherwise, I didn't feel this the show was uh, digital at all, really, or not, and not not in any central way. I was expecting, you know, again, sorry, I'm banging on, but age of outrage. I was expecting Twitter spats and all of that, and yeah. much more harsh commentary. Uh, you know, it was something to say about what do we do with what I call uh, hilariously anti-social media. Um, and there was n nothing of that. It was closer to the country file warm bath. Is it is it inherent in in having a theme that that then ties you down? Do you think that's part of the problem? Is don't have a theme. I mean, if you think of the great sketch comedies, um, mm. like I don't know, not the nine o'clock news or. Um, as you mentioned, although it was a bit more, it was more catchphrase comedy than sketch comedy, or so I was going to say, um, uh, the fast show, but like mm. Harry Enfield's television show, all of those kind of things. Yes, they had reoccurring characters, but they didn't, there wasn't a theme, was there? There wasn't an overarching theme. They were kind of about anything and everything. I mean, if you take Not the Nine O'Clock News, for example, one minute they were doing a song about squashing hedgehogs in a truck. Um, mm. And the next minute, they were doing things about um, a gorilla who's been captured in the wild and <laughs> talks and and eats wild daffodils and, allegedly. Um, yes. Yeah, and so, but there was no. It wasn't, you know, not the nine o'clock news. If you if you wrote a, a bit of blurb for that, what would you say about nine o'clock news? A collection of sketches from from four or five great comedians of the day. Yeah, but at the time, it felt uh, really edgy to. Compared to what I was, what I'd been uh, exposed to, as it were, uh, on mainstream TV. But I do want to say about the Fars show that um, it, it was catchphrase. But the genius was you still. I found so you knew by definition you knew what the punchline was, but you still cared how you got there. Yes, yeah, uh, and you went along for the ride, so to speak. But it, but is that part of the problem? Do you think is that they've kind of like you know they've been oyster by their own petard before they've even started because they've they've set out their stall as this is about this, and then it kind of has. I mean, not about you. But I think the modern digital age is almost now beyond parody because, I mean, some of the ridiculous things that you see and people are serious about are, are, are laughable in the, in the extreme. And you kind of think, how do, you par how do you even start to parody this rubbish? Uh, although I talked about Twitter without being specific, Twitter is so many things, just as TV is so many things or any other medium. Um, Yes, there's, there's certainly stuff which seems quite parody proof. What was it? The, was it Tom Lehrer who said uh, when uh, Henry Kissinger gets the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, a, a parody or, or satire is dead? He's dead, he said. Yeah. Um, what a and challenge. He was a satirist. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of that. I mean, let's not give up. On, I haven't given up on the sketch show by any means. And I haven't given up on this troupe who they've definitely got talent. I mean, they've learnt their lines, they don't bump into the furniture and mm. they look rather beautiful. Mm. They're all quite young good looking um the guy who was leading you might be able to help me with my names you know how terrible i am with them the guy who was leading the country file 
um, course for all my reservations. He he seemed to come out quite strong in anything he was in. I, I wanted to see a series with him in David Constant. His name is. Oh, what a beautiful name! I mean, yeah, he should be. He should be in a series of his name, and then then he would be the constant through every series. Yeah, it, highly thought. watchable. I think I completely agree with you on that one. Yeah, he was. I mean, but the rest of the cast weren't shabby either. I mean, they were a good no, cast. No, not and... at all. Uh, can I just float something? I've got to get this off my chest, which is that I've got a suspicion. I come back to commissioners because it, you know, the commissioners are still the, the big... Uh, uh, they're at the gate... What are they? The gatekeeper. Mm. Uh for traditional good old-fashioned steam television or even what we might call digital television we can we can change the technology and so on but you still you and i can't just walk on and walk into tv center as opposed to what was bbc tv center and say i just want to do a show tonight is that all right mm. but you and i can do a podcast in the comfort of our own home so the there's still that so there is a uh, there's the talented actors who are also as you pointed out um some of them, if not all, are, are the writers, co-writers of this. But they're at the mercy of what they're allowed to do. What the, uh, I mean, the clue is in the title. Dennis Potter, a TV writer, you'll know from, from the past. Some of our younger people might need to Google it. Uh, he said, you know, the clue is in the title. Controller. You know, the head of a TV channel is mm. a controller. Mm. You expect that at a railway station. You get it also at a TV station, whether you like it or not. So yeah. what I'm working round to is... I, I asked my girlfriend, because she, she liked some of this. We watched it uh, the first time together, and then I watched it the second time um, today. I floated to, to her, see, see if this floats with you. I wonder if our young friends here, the actors, uh, uh, and I don't mean that in a patronising way, it's just most performers these days are younger than me, um, that whether they are trying to do comedy that they think will appeal to the 55+. plus. Uh, because that's what they've been told to do, or it's, or it's, it's sort of double think or overthink. Has that got any mileage with you? Yeah, it has. I still think I still think they're they're stumped by their their initial premise. I think I think you know that that kind of all goes back to that, doesn't it? And and as you rightly point out, and I mean I have to see other episodes to see if it's if it's all like this. But th there was an awful lot of introspective. Um, this is what it's like in the BBC. Or this is what you're seeing on your screens if you watch the BBC, and this is why it's like that. And and I just, I, I, to me, that was where it all fell down. And and um, I, I don't know whether they're doubly hampered by this this whole virtual production shtick as well. This old mal malarkey, um, whether that became bigger than. You know what they were doing, or all the I could imagine all the higher echelons of BBC management. Oh, oh yes, we're going to, this is the way forward virtual productions, mm. and so you know, mm. so there's a lot of eyes on it and a lot of hands on it meddling with it. And I don't know, I think you're right, but but I mean, I, I was I came away thinking, oh, it was a bit like the BBC training film almost in a way, you know, you kind of think, <laughs> oh, I've had enough of the BBC now, I've got to go and uh, yeah. uh, cleanse myself by watching Channel 5 or something, I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> I don't now, know. But I think that's the first time that sentence has ever been uttered, the idea of cleansing yourself with Channel 5. I mean, how bad's it got? But there was a lovely double liner where they they put up a, a graphic at the end and the voiceover said, and as part of our dumbing down season tonight <laughs> on BBC One, the Balkan question with Ryland Clark Neal. And as we attempt to appeal to young people... <laughs> We'll be showing anything with Stacey Dooley in it, and I just thought, yes. yeah, those are two. Like, I mean, you str they're bullseyes, aren't they? Both of those. But um, come on, then let's whack some numbers on it, and I think you should go first. Oh, do you know when you, when you said wax and num numbers, I thought of waxing, and then we got to another uh, image which I really can't expunge. But I've got a split screen now. It's got a, a conical, or is it a comical bra on one side and then a leg waxing on the other side. Oh, thank God it was a leg wax, I don't know. I thought, <laughs> thought you were going to get more South Americans, to be honest with you, but there you we, are. We, I might work up to something else later on. You never know. Um, right. Do you want me to go first? Yes, please. Okay. I, For my money, I'm going to just go straight in the middle. I'm going to give it a two and a half. Um, uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to give it a two. Sorry, I've actually backtracked oh. on what I was going to say. I'm going to give it a two. It's funny because I was going to give it a two and a half. I was going to give it a two and a half, and I'm going to give it a two um, because I think um, it, it has, as we've talked about, some glaring weaknesses um, in terms of not least delivery. Uh, but I think great cast, um, writing... Sorry, what, what do you mean there by delivery? You're not talking acting delivery, or are you? 
No, it's in terms of um, a delivery in sense of, you know, hang on, we seem to have written a load of sketches about the BBC programmes. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, do you know what I mean? Content, yeah, yeah, yeah. content delivery rather. No, I thought the cast was great. I thought the acting was brilliant. It was top notch. Uh, no problems with any of that. But um, it just didn't, it didn't hit the mark for me consistently. And so it's a two out of five. Okay. Well, I am going straight down the middle. I tend to be... More often than not, I think, half a notch above you, though I think last week it was the other way around. Um, yeah, straight down the middle, I I kept my foot on the brake and tried to avoid my own age of outrage because um, I don't know the full story of how it came together. But yes, someone somewhere needs to get out more, and that might be the commissioner, to be fair, because they're fine performers. Um and there's no use that they could write all the non-TV based sketches they like. But if the commissioner says, this is really what I want, or this is hilarious, uh, give me more sketches about Country File, then that's what they've got to deliver, mm. um, which means the delivery problem that you've sort of touched on um, becomes our problem as viewers. So two and a half out of five. But I'd be interested in what follows uh, for any of those performers and or writers. I'm sure they've got some fabulous careers ahead of them. Uh, Age of Outrage, you can catch it on the iPlayer if you're listening kind of now, 2022, when we uh, sent this podcast out originally, although if you're listening sometime later, then you probably missed the boat. Four and a half out of five, four, the, uh, four and a half out of ten, rather, uh, for the Age of Outrage. So what have you got for us next week, then? Well, here's one. This is actually a punter suggestion, and I'm going to immediately backtrack and withdraw the word punter, because I don't like it used of me when I'm a well, a listener. Um, so, sorry about that, but uh, it's it's come from our audience. In particular, a gentleman by the name of Dave Benjamin, who found us on the YouTube, he says, has Bristow been done yet? Now, did, uh, be honest, did, did you have to run to Google to know what he was talking about, or were you there straight away? Not at all, not at all. I mean, this, this was uh, syndicated in the Birmingham Evening Mail, so in our household, mm. uh, the comic strip, uh, as it was then, um, was by uh, Frank Dickens, wasn't it, I think, who I think we suddenly yeah. lost a couple of years ago. Um, but, yeah, was well known, uh, as well as his catchphrase, good grief. Um, so, so yeah, and, and I was actually aware of the radio series as well because it's I've got it in my collection. Fantastic. Um, well, we're going to draw on your collection. Um, and, uh, yeah, similarly in my household, uh, well, of course, being a southerner, namby-pamby, um, uh, I have to refer to uh, the syndication in the South was with, in my youth, uh, the Evening Standard. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I was reading, well, we'll get into it more next week, but I think it broke a record as one of the longest comic strips running by, um, anyway, I'll get the, a single artist or something like that. Um, but this is converted into radio. And uh, for me, the big question is, uh, can it do it justice? Uh, how do you convert a comic strip into a radio show? Uh, and it's the BBC that what's done it. Yeah, we're sort of going in at the ground floor, but not of the not the very bottom ground floor because uh, there's more than one series. So I'm going for series two, episode one, so the ground floor of series two. So Bristow, series two, episode one, BBC radio show uh, converted from a comic strip, and we'll have to see uh, whether it works. All right, love it. That's for uh, for next week. Uh, don't forget, if you want to do as Dave did and uh, leave a suggestion anywhere, um, as long as you don't leave it under the mat because we never look under there, um, <laughs> then we're more than happy to say them. We've got a few suggestion episodes coming up, I think, because we, we do get from time to time people make some great... And I think Bristow's a great suggestion as well, but do make mm, some great yeah, suggestions. Thanks. So uh, don't forget you can catch us on YouTube, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify. Uh, we're on YouTube. Oh, I mentioned YouTube. That's twice, and uh, various <laughs> other uh, podcast platforms as well. So you can go back and have a listen to the previous episodes. And uh, as I say, normally where there's a comment area, uh, drop us a note, and it usually gets to us. I was going to say. I mean, obviously you've got you're receiving backhanders from YouTube. I was going to say Dave Benjamin from uh, 901 Cherry Avenue, San Bruno uh, in California. Then I realised that's the address of YouTube, YouTube not yeah. Dave Benjamin. Yeah, that's where the <laughs> checks come from. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where it... Uh, uh, well, okay. Well, cash them. Um, I didn't know anyone still using analogue checks. And uh, I'd like to just apologise for Adrian's uh, paranoia, <laughs> thinking that I'm getting some kind of backhander from people. I'd just like to finish the podcast this week by saying YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> Mercedes-Benz, <laughs> Blaupunkt, 
and <laughs> Aldi Blau for Font. some reason. I don't know where Aldi came from. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the, for the weekly shop, I think. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to say a little goodbye to. Oh. Uh, oh, see what I did there. And, uh, and uh, I would be insane if I didn't uh, mention Berry St Edmunds. Now, that doesn't work at all. Okay, that, that needs more work. Uh, back to my script editor. Have a great week. Thanks for listening.